though, so this particular section, uh, 5.5, .5, you might remember some of this math from uh, your Algebra 2 classes regarding uh, interest rates. So we're going to be dealing with a, a model that generally looks like this, or in general looks like this, uh, y equals 1 plus r to the t. So this is really an exponential function, right? I guess I could make that an x to make it a little more clear. Okay, This r in, in interest rate idea is your interest rate. This would be years, typically. And this would be the amount of money you have after your investment. There usually would be an A sub 0 or a P sub 0 here, your principal amount. And that equation looked like this, going back to Algebra 2. Your final amount is equal to your initial amount times 1 plus R to the T. Now, that's simple interest. Compounded interest would be A equals A sub 0, 1 plus R over N to the n times t, where n is the number of compounding periods. So this is all related to that. <clears throat> they don't present it in this manner. They present it in this manner. Or I should say it is, or I will present it in this manner. 1 plus r to the x. And then there will be this q, or quantity, or initial amount, or something like that. We could even stick with that c value, my initial amount. 1 plus rx. And so I think in earlier videos, you've heard me talk about this, this growth factor. If it was 1.7, then I'm keeping 100% of my original amount and adding another 70%. Or clearly in the last video, if I had 0.9, I'm keeping 90% of my initial value, right? Because I'm let's say that x was equal to 1 then my y value is going to be c times 0.9, which is 0.9c, 90% of c, okay? Right? Am I making sense? If I had 100 apples and I ate 10% of them, how much would I have left? Well, I'd have 90% of that left, which was 90 apples left, and I would have a bellyache. So if we're looking at this, the textbook, <clears throat> they're talking about exponential growth increased by a constant percent. So they're talking about the E. coli bacteria. And let's say we started out with n equals 1.37 times 10 to the 7th. That's my initial amount, my c value, 1 plus r to the x. I don't know if they're using x here. They have t. And then I'm multiplying it times 1.5 to the t. <clears throat> Sorry. So the number of E. coli bacteria and the amount of time that's gone by in unit time. So who cares? Days, months, weeks, minutes, seconds, whatever. It doesn't matter. T. So what we're interested in doing is taking this 1.5 and trying to figure out, well, 1.5 represents what percent increase each time period. So how do we do that? We're going to take our growth factor... And our growth factor is going to be equal to 1 plus r. So if I have the growth factor, I'm going to have 1.5 equals 1 plus r. I'm going to subtract 1 and get 0.5 is equal to r. And so what's 0.5 represented as a, as a decimal, excuse me, as a percentage? Well, 0.5 is 50%. So this 1.5, this growth factor of 1.5, so a growth factor of 1.5 represents a growth rate of 0.5 or 50%. So growth factor and growth rate. So the R is a growth rate. All right. That's what we discovered through this little discussion here and I just summed it up for you. So let's look at example one. Do a problem with this idea. <clears throat> the U.S. Bureau of Census has made a number of projections for the first half of this century. For each projection, convert the growth rate into a growth factor. So they say disposable income is projected to grow at an annual rate of 2.9%. 
So they're giving us a growth rate. So growth rate, excuse me, growth factor, which is A, is equal to 1 plus the growth rate. And so that's 1 plus R. Maybe I should do this. Uh, I don't want to cut it. That's what I want to do. I don't know why I'm taking so long to do this. Let's type this in here. That's growth factor equals 1 plus the growth rate. And in symbols, it's 1 A equals 1 plus R. Now, they've given us the growth rate in an annual basis. So 1 plus 2.9 percent. But of course, we never add percentages. We always add the decimal representation of those. So that's that. And so my growth factor is 1.029. So this is my growth factor. Okay. My growth factor is 1.029 when my growth rate is 2.9 percent. That's part A. Part B is non-agricultural employment is projected to grow at 1.1 percent per year. So again, we should be pausing now. You can sort it out and then check your answer. Pause. I don't have to tell you unpause because I won't be talking. But anyway, so remember, growth factor is equal to 1 plus my growth rate. In this case, my growth rate is 1 percent. If we represent that as a decimal rather than a percentage, that's 0 0.01. And so my growth factor is 1 point zero one okay in part C they say the employment in manufacturing is projected to grow at 0.2 percent per year so this is 0.2 percent per year so a is equal to 1 plus 0.2 percent but again we don't represent numbers as percentages when we're doing arithmetic with it so I have to change this into a decimal so that's 0 0.002 and so my growth factor is 1.002 this isn't even 1%, right? It's not even 1%. It's less than 1%. If 1% looks like 0 0.01, this is going to look like 0 0.002. All right? So let's go check our answers and I move on to example two. Uh, what do we got here? 1.029, 1.01, 1 .01, and 1.002, exactly as I stated. Okay, so example two, urban population projection. According to UN statistics in the year 2010, there were an estimated 3.4 billion people living in urban areas. The number of people living in urban areas is projected to grow at a rate of 1.9% per year. If this projection is accurate, how many people will be living in urban areas in 2030? So think about this. If I'm looking to project to 2030, then I really want a function, right? I want, want so, some sort of function. So if that's the case, I'm going to have... Uh, my starting amount equal to 3.4 billion. Now I can either turn that into 3.4 times 10 to the ninth, or I can just leave it as 3.4 and understand that my answer is going to be in billions. And my generic equation is going to be y equals c times a to the t, <clears throat> where c is my starting amount, 3.4 billion, and a is going to be what? Well, a is going to be my growth factor, and my growth factor is equal to 1 plus the growth rate. Since they've given me the growth rate of 1.9%, I'm going to substitute the growth rate, 0.9%, but then I have to convert that percentage into a decimal, so that's 1 plus 0 0.019. So my growth factor is 1.019. This gets substituted back into my original equation. Oh, I suppose I have it right there, yeah. 1, 1 1.019, and that's raised to the T, where T, T is number of years, because I'm treating that first 2010 as year zero, number of years past or after 2010. So now let's copy that equation down again. I have Y equals, you could say P if you wanted to for population. 3.4 billion times 1.019 to the t. Now 2030 is 20 years after 2010. So that means 
t is equal to 20. So I'm going to substitute 3.4, 1.019. Please pull your calculator out and do that math and hit pause. <clears throat> and so I'm going to type in 1.019 raised to the 20. And then I'm going to take that number and multiply it times 3.4. And I get 4.9, 4 4.954 billion. How's that? Well, let's see what the answer is. So they did all the work that we did, converted the decimal to, excuse me, the percentage to decimal, calculated the growth factor to be 1.019 by adding the growth rate to 1, wrote out their equation, 3.4 times 1.019 to the n. They used u and n instead of y and t. And then they calculated this to be 5 billion people. Well, we got 4.954, so that's they're rounding approximately 5 billion people, okay? So, now we're gonna talk about the same idea, but with exponential decay. E the book is going to present us with a different equation, but I'm going to tell you that we don't have to look at it that way. We can think of it as a rate and just idealize uh, decrease or increase. So in section 5.2, we use the exponential equation that where the peak amount of caffeine and then the amount of caffeine in my bloodstream dissipates, and so I have exponential decay. Right? They're just reviewing that example. And here's that exponential decay. And so what we're looking at here, they're trying to t teach us this idea. If I had this as my decay factor, my decay factor, if I change it to this, turns into a one minus my decay rate. And my decay rate is this positive number. So I can either say the decay rate is 12.9% because it is, and so decay factor is equal to one minus the decay rate. So again, growth factor, recall, growth factor is equal to one plus R, and decay factor is equal to one minus R. That's how the book is gonna present it. I really don't think of it that way. I think of it this way. Factor equals one plus or minus the rate, and if R is negative, then we have decay. Oops. And if R is positive, then growth. Okay? Again, if it's negative, I'm taking one minus some number. I'm going to have a number that's less than zero, correct? Uh, excuse me, less than one, correct? Which means A is less than one, which I have decay. If I have one plus some number, I'm going to be greater than one which means that A is greater than one, which means I have growth, decay, growth. So there are gonna be times when you have to read the language, understand when they say decay, you're gonna take that rate and subtract it from one. If it's growth, you're gonna add it to one. And you can think of the factor being that, or you can think of it as two different equations, these two different equations. Whichever works for you, doesn't matter to me. I prefer to remember less because my brain is limited. So I think of it as the plus minus thing. So here it is in summary. Here's your blue box. Factors, rates, and percentages. Growth factor, A is greater than 1. I get A equals 1 plus R. A is 1 minus R. And then there's some examples here that we can talk about or that you can take a look at. All right, I'll stop here. Copy this down. Or you should hit pause and you should copy this down. So example 3. I'm trying to go faster because these half-hour videos are probably killing you guys. So sea ice that survives the summer and remains year-round called... Perennial sea ice is melting at an alarming rate of 9% per decade. According to a 2006 report by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, that's otherwise known as NOAA or NOAA, assuming the percent decrease per decade in sea ice remains constant, construct a function that represents the decline. So this is exponential decay. So I have a 9% decrease or decay rate per 10 years. So I have y equals c 1 minus 0 0.09 
to the T, let's say capital T. And capital T is equal to number of 10 year periods or intervals. They've been using the word interval and I keep saying period, intervals, okay? And so assuming a percent decrease per decade in sea ice remains constant, construct a function that represents this decline. Now they haven't given us the initial amount, so we're not gonna have an initial amount. Uh, you could say we have 100% now if we wanted to start counting right now. And they tell us the decay factor, blah, blah, blah. C ice, D for decline, I guess. A is the amount of ice and we have 0.91. And that's because once we start doing the math, 1 minus 0 0.09 is 0 0.91, right? They used A and S. I used Y and C, okay? Example four, growth or decay. So we're just going to look at the bottom here. In the following functions, identify the growth or decay factors and the score corresponding growth or decay rates in both percentage and decimal form. So you should probably hit pause. Oops, there's a bunch of stuff from last time I didn't get off here. You might want to hit pause and work that work all that stuff out. And now that you've unpaused, A, I have 0 0.01. So this is the decay factor. And the decay rate, A equals 1 minus R. 0 0.01 equals 1 minus R. I'm going to subtract 1. And I'm going to negative 0.99 equals negative R, which means R equals 0.99. This is me doing it the one, uh, this is me doing it the way I think about it. And so I get R is equals 99, so the decay rate is 99%. Now this also goes to what I was saying previously um, when my decay factor is 0.01, I'm removing 99% because it's decaying at a 99% rate. I also think of it as I'm keeping 0 0.01, or in other words, I'm keeping 1% of whatever the number was previously. Because I'm gonna take my starting amount, for instance, C, in this case it's 100, multiply it times 0 0.01 at X equals one. I'm gonna keep 1% 1 of 100, so it's gonna be one. Then when I do it a second time, X equals two, I'm gonna multiply one times 0 0.01, and I'm gonna get 0 0.01. All right, so hopefully that's clear, understandable, thoughtful. I don't know. So um, that was A, B. Oops. B is uh, G of X equals 230, my initial amount, times 3.02 raised to the X. So A equals 1. Is this growth decay or... Um, is this growth or decay? So I'm going to do this two ways so you can see how I do this with uh, the way I think about it. I don't think about it as plus or minuses. I just think about it as plus, and if the R is negative, then it's decay. So A, R, A equals 1 plus R. This is my factor, so this goes in at 3.02 equals 1 plus R. If I subtract 1, I'm going to get 2.02 .02 is equal to R. So R is a growth rate of 2.02. .02. Now that's not written as a percentage, right? That's a decimal. So it really represents a 202% increase for every x or per x, okay? And that's of course exponential growth. And C is P equals 5.34, my initial amount times 0 0.015 raised to the n. And so I'm going to take this, that's my factor. Let's not say whether it's decay or growth. I'm going to do this two times. I said I was going to do the last one two times, but I didn't need to because it, it turned out to be positive, right? So this one is a, we know that it's a decay factor, I hope, because it's less than one. But let's pretend that we don't know. It's just a factor. And I know that it's going to be one plus r. Correct. If you wanted to separate and remember two different equations, you would use one minus R and your R value will be the decay rate. But I'm gonna pretend as if I don't know, when I subtract one from both sides, I'm gonna get negative uh, 0 
point nine eight five. So I can say my rate is negative 0.985, or I can say my decay rate. How do I know it's decay? Well, because of this, but if I forget, if I get a negative sign, it is definitely decay. So my decay rate is 0.985, not 0.985, or you could say that it's 98.5%, all right? Now, if you wanted to do it the other way, you would write a equals one minus r, knowing that it's decay from the start, and just go uh, zero zero point zero one five equals one minus r. And when I subtract one from both sides, I'm still going to get zero point nine eight five, but it's going to be positive because my negative sign is over here. And so um, I'm going to divide both sides or multiply both sides by negative one and I get, I'm sorry, I got a negative sign over there and I'm gonna get R equals 0.985. But I have to apply the idea that that rate is actually a decay rate because I understand what's going on with the problem. So my decay rate is 0.985 or 98.5%, okay? And the last one, D, is y equals 8.75, and that's multiplied times a factor of 2.35. So right away we see that this, of course, is growth factor, A equals 1 plus R, and 2.35 equals 1 plus R, subtract 1 from both sides, I get 1.35. That's R, so my rate, my decay rate is 1.35 or 135%, okay? So let's check our answers. 99, 99.99 or 99%, 2.02 .02 or 200%, 0.985 or 98.5%, and 1.35 or 135 percent. Okay, so we're going to rule this whole linear versus exponential again. Linear function represents quantities that increase or decrease by a constant amount. Exponential represent quantities that increase or decrease by a constant percentage. And so that percentage can be represented either as a factor or as a rate. So let's look at example five. Identifying linear versus exponential growth. According to industry sources, U.S. wireless data service revenues are growing at 35 percent annually. 34% annually, I think I just said 35. India is the biggest growth market, increasing by about 8 million new cell phone subscribers per every month. Which of these two statements represents linear and which represents exponential growth? Justify your answers. Okay, so 34% annually, or 8 million new cell phone subscribers every month, which one is linear? So hit pause. So it should be pretty clear, since this is growing at a percentage a rate that the, the service revenues is growing at an exponential rate, whereas the 8 million new cell phone subscribers every month is growing at a linear rate. Quantities that increase by a constant amount, so an increase in 8 million cell phones is linear, 34% annually is exponential growth. Okay, so example six. Using constant, uh, using constant, so example six, using constant amount and constant percent to construct functions. Okay, construct an equation for each description of the population of four different cities. So part A is in 1950, city A had a population of 123,000 people. Each year since 1950, the population decreased by 0.8%. So this is decay, and my decay rate is equal to 0.08%, which of course as a decimal, is point, why did I read that right? Point zero, no, it's point eight, sorry. It's point eight. So that means that as a decimal is point zero, zero eight, because this is less than one already, right? If it was 1%, it'd be point zero one. So if I'm trying to construct an equation, I'm gonna say population of A, or something like that, is equal to 123,000 people. That's my initial amount. 
times this, and you can either write it as 1 minus 0 0.008 per t, where t is number of years after 1950. And you could subtract that out and write this as 0.992 if you desire. Okay. Part B, in 1950, City B had a population of 4.5 million. Since 1950, the population has grown at approximately 2,000 people per year. So if it's adding 2,000 people each year, then this is linear, right? So this is going to be 4.5 million in 1950, and my population of B is equal to that, plus for each year, T, I'm going to add 2,000 people, right? So there's my linear equation. Part C, thought I did hit that, but part C. In 1950, City C had a population of 625,000. Since 1950, population has declined by about 5,000 people each decade. So population of City C is equal to 625,000. Uh, minus because it's declining, right? It's declining 5,000 people. And I'm going to use a cap T because T is equal to number of decades after 1950. Because now we're going for decades, right? That's the way it was described in the problem. And part D. Part D in 1950, City D had a population of 2.1 million. Each decade since 1950, the population has increased by 15%. So that means the population of D is equal to 2.1 million people, 2.1 times. And so this is in millions. We need to keep track of units all the time. And this is 1 plus 0.15. And you could write it as 1.15. Is that what they said, 15%? Yep. And this is each decade. And so I'm using cap T again because tap t, cap T I was using as number of decades. Oops. After 1950. Okay. So let's go check our answers. Uh, what do we got? One point. 123, so this is in hundreds of thousands, and we get 0.992 as well. We get 4,500 plus 2, so they're writing this as thousands, so they're taking this off and this off, so we're basically dividing everything by a thousand. And then this next one's a linear equation, they're writing as 625 thousands, right? So that's going to be minus 5t, and then this bottom one is written as 2100, so that's in thousands. So they're just making them all in thousands. Did they tell us that? They did not, so screw them. <laughs> but we get, why do we get 1.014? Oh, so they did this thing. They did that thing like we did in, uh, two, I think, two videos ago. So I wrote it as 1.15, but T was representing decades, okay, decades. And what they've done here is they're changing the growth factor to instead of having decades, they're going to write it in per year. And so each year is one-tenth of a decade. So that's why they did this thing. That would be like me doing the following. Recall P of D is equal to 2.1, 1.15 to the T. But T is equal to 10 little t's, where little t is a year, right? So if I want to change this to little t, I have to take this is equal to little t. And so if I want to change this to little t, I have to write this like that. 1, 5. That thing divided by 10, which is representative of a single year, right? And then split this exponent split this exponent up into two different pieces 0.15 raised to the one tenth all of that raised to the little t now oh i so i suppose i should have written it that way this is the little t 
and this is big T. Yeah, it doesn't make sense that way though. So my big T divided by that, this is now little t. This doesn't make sense either. I don't, I'm, I, if you don't follow me, I can understand. I gotta think about a different way to explain that. It, it makes sense in my head. Um, 10 little t's equal one big T. So little t is written as that, but then this needs to be written as little t because it represents, yeah, I don't know if there's a better way to do that. Hmm. In any case, um, if we're having trouble with that, you know, ask me during our Zoom time. So I get 2.1, and if I take 1.15 and raise it to the 1 tenth, I get approximately 1.014. And so I'm, I'm gaining 15% of the population. I'm increasing by 15% every 10 years, but I'm increasing by 1.4% every year. So that's the difference between the two. Example seven, which I think is the last example. So let's see what we got here. So example seven, when the average rate of change is not constant. So when your average rate of change is not constant, which means it's not linear, you are offered a job with a salary of $30,000 a year and an annual raise of $5,000 for the first 10 years of employment. Show why the average rate of change of your salary in dollars per year is not constant. So if I'm gaining 5% per year, hopefully you recognize now that that's an exponential function. I'm gaining 5% per year. And so my average rate of change from here to there is that. My average rate of change from here to this point is that. Let's say that this is after one year and this is after two years. And so after five years, my average rate of change, I know I'm not, my my division marks, my horizontal marks are not the same. But let's say that, so notice how my average rate of change is not the same for any of those three, okay? That's not what they want us to do here. Let's just take a look at what they want us to do. So they're asking us to calculate for each given year how much I'm gonna make more. And notice how if I compare those points and take the slope, they will not be the same, right? So if I looked at, at, at time zero, I'm going to be making $30,000, right? If I have my, add my 5% of 30, which is that, you could also think of it as 30,000 times one, sorry, 30,000 times 1.05. I'm going to keep this and add another 5%. Then I'll get um, 30,000, 31.5, right? And so it, after one year, my 5% increase is 31,500. But after two years, I'm gonna end up, if I put two in here, I'm gonna end up having uh, 33,000 and $75 salary. If I found the slope between those two, those two points, it will be $1,500 per year. Why? Because that's how much more money I'm making after that year. But if I find the slope between these two points, I end up getting 1575 per year. Okay, that's the average. It's as if I got 1575 the second year and 1575 the first year. But we know it wasn't distributed that way because I only got 1500 the first year. So the average rate of change is not the same across all the 5 years. It gradually increases. Why? Because I'm taking I'm adding 5% of a larger number than what I started out with. So the first year I'm adding 5% I'm adding 5% of 30,000. The second time, I'm adding 5% of 31,000. Why? Because my new salary, the salary I started out with the, at the beginning of the year was 31,500 instead of two years ago at 30,000. And that's it for the section. So hopefully that was clear. And again, come to uh, the Zoom on Thursday or Friday if it's not, and we can talk about it some more and maybe create some examples. All right?